Welcome back into the Lions 24-7 podcast. I am Tyler Donahue. It's another game week preview, game number six on the 2023 schedule for these Penn State Nittany Lions. Number six right now in the AP Top 25 poll. Of course, the college football playoff rankings are the ones that will matter in just a matter of weeks. And bigger tests lie ahead, but Penn State back in Beaver Stadium following the bye week. A little bit rested, recuperated, you'd imagine, and facing a UMass squad that comes in here limping, six-game losing streak after a season-opening win. We're going to break down this matchup from a Nittany Lions perspective, offer our players to watch our predictions for this matchup a little later with Mark Brennan and Daniel Gallon. We'll also offer some thoughts on conversations that have occurred throughout this game week with Penn State coaches and players. We also had a look at practice on Wednesday evening over at the Lash facilities. So a lot to deal with here in that segment, but we begin here with Michael Trainey, who covers UMass with 24-7 Sports. Uh, he's been doing that for the better part of, of nearly a decade here, so a lot of intel on that program, and happy to have you on to provide some perspective on, again, a 1-6 in six team that is coming in as a massive underdog. Well, thanks for having me on, Tyler. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be an it's an interesting game. You know, it's uh, it'll be it's good for UMass. They they get a nice paycheck out of it, but you know, it should be a pretty pretty easy day at the office. I think for the Nittany Lions on their on their quest to make the college football playoff. Yeah, more than one million dollars heading north, regardless of the outcome. And you know, the right now, as we'll get into one of our predictions a little bit later with some of my colleagues, um, it, it's a large, large point spread. You know, six touchdowns essentially is what Vegas has determined it at. And uh, Michael, can you give us the good, bad, and ugly, the journey to one and six thus far for the Minutemen as they prepare to make this trip? Yeah, I mean, they started off the season pretty well. I mean, obviously, it's been a struggle, not just this year, but since they moved up to the FBS uh, level in 2012, uh, have never been bowl eligible. Um, and it, it's it's been a long time. They're on their fourth coaching staff with uh, Don Brown, former Michigan defensive coordinator that uh, Penn State fans, Big Ten fans will know. Um, he had a lot of success when UMass was in FCS. Back in the mid-aughts, he took them to an FCS national title game that they lost to App State. But they, uh, they struggled last year in Brown's first season back, 1-11. This year, they were hoping to be a little different. You know, they obviously had some high, expe high expectations, but it's been very difficult so far. They won their Week 0 matchup, and it kind of – maybe they bought into their own hype a little bit too much. And since then, it's it's been a tough six-game losing streak. Uh, defense took a big step back this year. And not to say that last year's 1-11 team had a great defense, but they were better than this. Uh, so it's it's been very tough. Uh, run defense in particular has been very bad. The secondary has been bad. So they, the good is that week zero win um, on the road at New Mexico State. But since then, it's been primarily ugly. Uh, and, you know, it's it unfortunately set to probably get a little uglier on Saturday. That opener, uh, 41 30 uh, at New Mexico State. This is one of the few independent programs out there in college football. So you kind of look at their schedule and you're like, oh, that team's on there, that team's on there. And you're not quite sure what you're going to see week to week. They have faced one Power Five squad, and that was week two. Uh, for them, I guess it was week one for most schools. It was uh, they had that week zero victory at Auburn, which is where Penn State went to town uh, last year and ended up getting a blowout victory on the road. 59-14 uh, loss against the Tigers. Since that's the the Power Five level opponent that we have to to go off of here in 2023 uh, for this UMass squad, what stood out to you that day? And, and and were you expecting maybe a better performance overall from the Minutemen, or was that really what your expectation was? Uh, in that particular game, I, we were probably expecting a better performance simply because they were coming off that week zero win. And they had a new quarterback, um, <clears throat> Tyson Pumachan. He's a Clemson and Georgia Tech transfer. Uh, he came back to UMass. He's a, a Connecticut native, so he, he came back home. He won the starting job out of camp, and he had a great performance against New Mexico State. Um, their first drive against Auburn, they uh, they took the ball right down the field and scored. It, it was one of the best drives that the entire program has had in a long time. They looked great, but unfortunately, Pumachan got hurt on that drive. It defected the rest of the game, and then he subsequently missed the next, I believe, three or four games. So we expected a little bit better performance. Uh, nothing, nothing close to like an upset victory, but probably you know covering a large spread. Uh, they had had a streak of of covering against the SEC that went back to about uh, about ten or eleven years, and unfortunately that's out the window now. But yeah, that game sort of went off the rails pretty quick, and uh, it, it sort of gave you an idea that this team's, uh, especially defensively, was not where they expected to be, and they're not even as good as they were in the previous season. So it was a little bit tough, and obviously Penn State is um, 
is a better team than Auburn is. And so it's it, it, they, especially now on the heels of a six game losing streak, it's, it's a tough matchup for UMass, but you know, they have some explosive players on offense, but it's uh, you know, defensively is where the concern is. So that, you know, we'll, we'll see how it plays out Saturday. You referenced Puma Chan and, and he's a guy that James Franklin brought up during his Tuesday press conference and saying, you know, they were involved pretty heavily in that recruitment. He ultimately signed out of high school uh, with the Clemson Tigers ends up uh, with UMass via Georgia tech. So been a bit of a, a long and winding road for him, but when he has been healthy and I know he's been back of late for them since that early September injury, what does it look like with him as the trigger man of this offense? It, it looks pretty good. Uh, you know, he is not 100% right now, but he's healthy enough to play and he's gotten it out. Um, he looked better last week against Toledo than he did the previous week. But so he's he's working on getting better every day. And, you know, they have a bye week coming up after this. UMass does. So that'll be helpful. But, you know, it, he's when healthy. If you reference that New Mexico State game, it, it was very dynamic. Uh, the way Steve Casula, who's the offensive coordinator, his offense is designed to work is with a mobile quarterback, uh, someone who can run on RPO and, and be the design ball carrier 10 to 15 times a game. So without him, it, that certainly hurt their ability to do that. He's back. He's, he's trying to work into the running, but his rushing ability is definitely hindered because it's a leg injury he's dealing with. So he'll help them in the pass game. You know, they look pretty good with some of their explosive pass plays against Toledo. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't enough, but he's, he's a dynamic player and, you know, better when healthy, but he's still, uh, you know, the best option UMass has right now. The statistics have reflected your point here is in his rushing totals, 96 yards on the ground in that season opening win, including a score, 34 yards early at Auburn, including a touchdown on the ground. Uh, he's landed in, in negative yardage total, yeah. uh, you know, factoring in sacks and all that. But he he's, has not been a factor with his legs. And is your anticipation that ahead of this bye week and considering they've they have they've had relentless schedule so far, seven games already under their belt? that Puma Chan's not going to be in a position to evade pressure too well against Penn State or do a lot beyond the pocket versus maybe where you would have thought in this matchup on paper was uh, early September? Oh, yeah, I, I, I would say so. I mean, if you know, were he healthy, he could he could be a problem for, I mean, even a Penn State defense trying to contain him. But in his current state, he's he's going to have a difficult time avoiding a pass rush. He did he did a decent job against Toledo, you know, trying not to take sacks. I mean, and every quarterback's going to going to go down at some point. But um, Penn State's defense is a different animal, so it, it's it's definitely going to be a challenge for him to make sure that he doesn't take too many sacks, or you know, if when needed, he can get rid of the ball, things like that. So but yeah, unfortunately, the uh, the scrambling part of his game is uh, is not at peak efficiency right now. He was a 20 of 31 passing for 272 yards with two touchdowns, one interception and a 41 24 loss against Toledo last Saturday. And I'd imagine they're going to want to get the ball out of his hands pretty quickly. So when they look downfield, whether it's short intermediate or even going for some you know, exclamation points and trying to make a statement on the road, who are those weapons that the Nittany Lions fans need to be aware of entering Beaver Stadium on Saturday afternoon? Yeah, I mean, as far as receivers go, number one weapon is going to be Anthony Simpson. He's an Arizona transfer, uh, another kid from Connecticut that came back to New England. Uh, he's, I think, sitting about ninth in FBS in receiving yards right now. Um, he's, he's got explosive speed. Uh, they'll use him in the run game as well. They'll give him jet sweeps, reverses. Uh, they, they try to hit him on deep balls whenever they can. They've also got a couple of other power transfers on their team. Um, Mark Pope, who... Uh, Started at Miami and then uh, was at Jackson State last year. Some fans might remember him from uh, the Deion Sanders stuff. They, you know, ended up being removed from the team. Uh, but there's also George Johnson the third, who uh, started as a cornerback at Michigan for Don Brown, and then he switched to wide receiver here uh, at UMass. They, they've got some weapons uh, offensively in the receiving game that they did not have last year. And then you add Puma Chan to that, and it's really helped the offense become something that, you know, is a going concern as opposed to last year, the offense was non-existent. So receivers, th those are your main guys. And then uh, the biggest offensive weapon that UMass probably is going to use will be uh, running back Karon Lynch Adams. He was a former Rutgers uh, running back that transferred to UMass a few years ago. He's having a phenomenal season. I don't have the number in front of me, but I believe he's somewhere in the top 20 in rushing yards in FBS. He just had a career high against Toledo, about 150 yards with a score. So th there are some offensive weapons that Penn State fans will have to kind of watch out for that the Penn State defensive coaching staff will have to game plan for. It might be good enough for a, su a surprise score, but uh, I'm sure, you know, they'll have that keyed in on without a doubt. When you've discussed the, the issues for this 2023 UMass team, you've constantly circled back to the defense. So what are the most glaring uh, problems on that side of the football against a Penn State team that, 
obviously brings a lot of weapons to the football field of the blue chip caliber. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it's too simple to say everywhere, but uh, it's been pretty much <laughs> everywhere. The secondary, which is supposed to be, which, which I, I certainly believe would have been the deepest and most talented group uh, of this defense to begin the year, has has really struggled. Uh, there have been some injuries back there uh, that they're trying to deal with. They have uh, Tyler Rudolph, who's a former Penn State uh, safety, uh, who transferred another Connecticut kid who transferred back to uh, New England. He uh, was started last year for UMass. He was starting this year. He just he suffered a shoulder injury a couple weeks ago, so he's unlikely to play this week. Um, but their two starting corners have have struggled with injury, and and that they've given up a ton of explosive pass plays uh, to pretty much every opponent. They've given them up at inopportune times, and and that's been difficult. But also their rush defense is. Um, I believe third worst in the nation right now. Uh, so the front seven is not getting a lot of pressure on the quarterback. They are not doing a good job uh, as far as creating havoc. And they've had a struggle tackling, struggle slowing down run games. And, and Penn State's run game is, you know, is going to be keyed up for a big one on Saturday. Um, before we get to your prediction, you know, kind of final take on this matchup. Don Brown, as you mentioned, got some familiarity with him uh, here at, when he was the Michigan defensive coordinator for all those years. Obviously, the, the defense being a struggle bus right now is is not great, but he's two and seventeen uh, thus far with the Minutemen since taking over in twenty twenty two. Back before this squad made the jump up to the FBS level, uh, he was forty three and nineteen uh, with the Minutemen from two thousand four to two thousand eight. What is your assessment of, of Don Brown's? return in this reclamation project that he's trying to undertake and how viable is it that you know UMass is able to get to the point where they can talk about bowl eligibility and do you think that's anywhere around the corner right now for the program yeah it's difficult I mean um, you know as someone who attended the school back in the day when Don was the head coach uh, you know Don's a great coach and he's you know as far as New England football goes, he's maybe the quintessential New England football guy. I mean, college football doesn't have the same cachet up in this area than it does even in Pennsylvania or other parts of the country, of course. But, uh, you know, people do enjoy it. It's just, unfortunately, the state of college football in New England, not just for UMass, but, you know, UConn, Boston College, they're also struggling right now. So it, it can be a little bit tough. Um, I think Don was probably the best option for the job when they hired him. Um, Walt Bell, who was the previous head coach, uh, who just was also just recently fired from Indiana, as their offensive coordinator, he um, had a disastrous tenure as the head coach here, um, only won a couple of games over three years and was replaced midseason in his last year after losing uh, his, to his third FCS opponent in those three years. Uh, it's been very tough. I mean, the biggest thing UMass is facing is not having a conference. You know, you mentioned that independent schedule at the beginning here. And, you know, it's tough when a, a school like UMass, which doesn't have the same investment as other programs, they don't have the same payouts that they can get from being in a football conference has to go and play two big payday games against Auburn and Penn state. You know, they'll have to travel across the country to New Mexico state. They have to travel, you know, they, they pretty much everywhere for, you know, it could be all over the place for their uh, away games. It's a difficult situation to be in viability for bowl eligibility. I mean, obviously the program thought that they could do it this year and they had a schedule that was set up to potentially do that. Unfortunately, they taken a step back and that's, that's too bad because they had some games uh, that they blew, they blew leads in that they should have won. Uh, and it, it's been tough. They still have a chance at the end of this year to make some progress off the one and 11 last year, maybe get to about three and nine with uh, an FCS game, still the comedy uh, game against UConn to end the year. Um, frankly though, the way this team is set up without a conference, they really do need to get to bowl eligibility in order to make a conference interested in them. So Next season is probably, you know, that's year three of Don being back and they're going to need to, if this season obviously has not gone the way they wanted, they pretty much need to be bowl eligible next year. That's a tough spot to be in for a school that hasn't been able to do it since they moved up and they have a tough schedule next year. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned the travel, they play three SEC schools next year. Uh, they have to travel to Mississippi State. They have to travel to Georgia and they're hosting Missouri in Amherst, which is kind of fun. That'll be good. But they, you know, it's a tough schedule that they've they've built for themselves, and it's always a tough schedule when you're an FBS independent. So, it, it's not an easy place to be. Uh, you know, the best thing they can do is somehow find a place to put this program and and get a conference home. And you know, it's sort of a chicken and egg issue. So we'll see how next year goes. But they need to try to finish this year strong after this week's game and just kind of come out of it with no major injuries. I think that's both. That's probably the best case scenario for them. Well, we'll get a closer look at the Minutemen on Saturday afternoon come kickoff. When that happens, how do you see this matchup playing out? What's your prediction on the final score? 
Yeah, um, it's not going to be pretty. I mean, it'll be pretty for Nittany Lion fans. It won't be pretty for UMass. I mean, I went 59 to 10 for Penn State. I know the spread's 42. I, I think whatever Vegas set the spread at, it's probably not going to be big enough. It, it's just, it's a, I mean, it's a mismatch at the best of times. And unfortunately, right now, that is not where UMass is. And, and Penn State is, is riding high. Uh, you know, they're coming off a of bye week. And I, I don't think they're going to be looking ahead to Ohio state or anything like that. I think they're going to take care of business in this game. This is one of those games where I don't think Penn state is going to have to punt the ball. That, that's the type of game it's going to be. I, I think they'll be able to get their backups in early. They'll get them a lot of run, which will be good for Penn state, you know, down the line this season. But yeah, it's, it's going to be a, an easy day of work for the Nittany lions. And hopefully, like I said, UMass can get out of there without any major injuries. They can take their check and, and then focus on their own bye week. Michael Traney uh, covers UMass for Fight Massachusetts within the 24-7 Sports Network. Really happy to get you on. And uh, I just learned a lot about this program, where they're at. We'll see what happens on Saturday. Thanks a lot. Oh, thanks, Tyler. Anytime. Appreciate you guys having me. Let's shift gears and focus on these Nittany Lions now, who, uh, as Michael Traney right there laid it out, it should not have much of an issue in getting win number six on Saturday. But how they get there, the style points are going to matter a little bit in this one, especially as you prepare to get to the Ohio State matchup on the road next week in Columbus. And to help break things down here, Daniel Gallon and Mark Brennan, uh, my buddies at Lions247.com. Good to have you both back on board. Yeah, that was terrific. I mean, I don't know where you're going to get a more detailed breakdown of UMass and what it's all about. So that was a great job by Mike. Definitely. Uh, it's, you know, I think the style points thing you brought up, Tyler, is uh, a very, very valid uh, thing. <clears throat> and, you know, I, I thought it was interesting what he said with no spread big enough. I mean, a lot of times when I see these big numbers, I'm you know a little cautious because how much is actually 42 points? Like, that's a lot. Um, but, you know, when you're hearing it from someone that's seen everything, uh, definitely makes you think. And if you're looking for style points from Daniel Gallon today on the podcast, don't, uh, because he's gotten this one out, got a, got a bit of a cold, which is tis the season for all of us. It's probably a rotation at this point on the Penn State beat right now. I'm feeling okay. I think Mark is too. We'll be situated next to each other at the press box on Saturday. So we'll see how we all shape up through the week. But I appreciate you hopping on with us, Daniel, through that. But let's begin with Mark, give you a little bit of a break for the moment. Uh, and, and team health is obviously a big topic whenever you got a team coming out of the bye week. This is a team that was fortunate enough because of the games and because of the way they coached them uh, to reach that bye week relatively healthy, especially on the defensive side of the football. Offensively, though, Mark, we went to the practice field, keeping close tabs on a couple guys who have been starters at points but have been missing of late, and that is J.B. Nelson, the offensive guard, Harrison Wallace, the wide receiver. Wallace, as usual, you could say, was a participant on the practice field. Optimism seems to be pointing towards his return. What do you make of what he can do for this group moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I think getting him back at full go is going to be big. I mean, simply because in his absence, nobody really stepped up or his his kind of absence. He did play in the Iowa game, but he didn't do a whole heck of a lot. But he missed the two other games at, uh, at the two other uh, most recent games. So, yeah, I mean, it, you're looking at a guy who had 10 catches through the first two games and nobody else has been able to do that consistency. So consistently. So I think going into this season, we knew about Keandre Lambert Smith and, and, and Trey Wallace and, and kind of figured that they would be the two guys. And we were wondering who else would be the, step up into the, one of those uh, top three roles and nobody's done it. And I think that just amplifies how important he is. Now, if he comes back, does that make it a little bit easier for one of these other receivers to kind of maybe not have the spotlight on them, not have nearly as much pressure. Uh, but, you know, guys have had opportunities, right? I mean, Malik McClain had a, an opportunity at Illinois and dropped a couple balls. Dante Cephas had, what, three catches in the last couple games that he started. So guys have been given opportunities and they haven't seized it. So getting him back, I, I think, for this offense is going to be big to give them two viable options in that receiving core. I think we've spent a lot of time between this week and then the tail end of last week when we had some of our bye week roundtable conversation, breaking down what Harrison Wallace and his value and, and how his ceiling is kind of matched up with his offensive ceiling in certain ways. But, Daniel, you had eyes on this whole collective wide receiver unit. Don't talk to me about Keandre Lambert-Smith. I know all about Keandre Lambert-Smith. Who else beyond those two 
um, we, you know, did you come away off the practice field with some fresh thoughts or, or just, you know, some curiosity as we creep closer toward another kickoff? Yeah, I thought that one thing was interesting was seeing Malik McLean go through some, go through some drills um, a little bit higher up in line. Um, I mean, he's been, you know, more or less invisible since that Illinois game. I mean, you really do- documented how his snap counts were dwindling um, over the over the past couple of weeks. So, you know, it was interesting to see him up uh, higher in line. I mean, you know, I think that there's, you know, Dante Cephas, I think, is still someone that people are waiting for. But I think the bigger question mark kind of is still Omari Evans. Like, when are we going to see that? When is he going to be able to to break through one way or another? Um, you know, he's played so much, especially in these past two weeks, but with really nothing to show for it. Um, so, you know, we saw him, you know, going through things, catching passes from Drew Aller. Um, you know, it's a it's a very curious group um, to kind of try to figure out what you're going to get. I mean, I think the one spot that outside of Keandre Lambert Smith that feels pretty settled is the slot uh, where you have Liam Clifford and Caden Saunders. And then, you know, if something were to happen or depending on a matchup, maybe you'd see Lambert Smith get a little bit of time there. But, you know, I, I think that looking at this wide receiver group, um, you know, we're still waiting for someone else to step up and have that game. I mean, you know, Mark talked about it. Uh, Harrison Wallace had those 10 catches in two games. Uh, you know, no other wide receivers have come cl- have equaled that. Um, it's just been, you know, what, who is going to do it? What is that going to look like? And when someone finally steps up, I mean, What is that going to do for the offense? I think that that's something that people have a lot of questions about, especially, you know, when you talk about explosive plays and everything there. So, yeah, I mean, I think that, yeah, if Penn State can get Harrison Wallace back at full strength this weekend, especially ahead of Ohio State, I think that's a huge deal. I think that can really do a lot for Drew Aller in this offense. So, you know, we'll have to wait and see. I mean, receivers talk so much about the opportunity, just looking for opportunities. There's been a lot of guys who have had opportunities through the first five games of the season because of what happened with Harrison Wallace, because of what happened with some of these scores. And we know that Penn State, with Bo Perbula or not in the fourth quarter, they want to try to maintain some kind of normal offensive pattern rather than fold up and, and, and take knees and run the football. So there's been some passing late in the games. You know, Amari Evans was involved in the fourth quarter. So there's been a lot of opportunity. But to this point, Harrison Wallace feels like he's in a situation to be like, all right, I'm back. And 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 if he's ready to seize that moment, he may not be off the field much, just like we haven't seen Keandre Lambert Smith off the field much to this point. And meanwhile, on the offensive line, uh, that, that whole rotational aspect is, is kind of come unraveled just a bit because of the health standpoint at some spots. And and left guard is one that's that's hard to ignore right now. Landon Tengwall, of course, uh, medically retiring in August, you know, came in August as the projected starter at that position. And then J.B. Nelson, who a lot of people pointed to as saying he's ready uh, and, and he looked the part for the most of, uh, of September. Now that he's in question, he was caught it off the sideline on the road at Northwestern. We have not seen him at two looks uh, at this practice since uh, since then. And we'll see on Saturday. We'll be keeping close tabs as usual with our binoculars from the press box. But I would quite frankly be surprised if he was out there in in uniform based on what we have not seen to this point. So, Mark, that brings a few new components in play here. It means Venga Ioane goes from that supplemental piece. I know they want to call him a six or seven starter for this group, along with Drew Shelton. But he goes from being that to a full-fledged first teamer. And then the question becomes, okay, is there still a rotation at guard? Because it's worked really well for them. They've gotten Wormley off the field at times. They've gotten Venga off the field at times. But if J.B. Nelson is not available, is Nick Dawkins getting thrown in the mix? Or, this is the new wrinkle, Caden Wallace. Something that we saw on the field last week. We didn't bring it up on the podcast, but our VIP subscribers were reading about it last week on lines247.com. Caden Wallace was repping at left guard at practice last Wednesday during the bye week. And we've been at every single practice portion since Caden Wallace enrolled on campus back in 2019. And I believe maybe early in that freshman season in 2019, we saw him taking reps at guard. Um, since then, though, he surfaced as the starting right tackle, pushing Will Fries into right guard as a registered freshman. And he was has been the right tackle for this team when healthy, essentially, all the way through. Now, with you with your depleted at left guard, Mark, James says it's a it's a it's a versatility piece. It's something that they're exploring. Um, it feels like it can benefit Caden Wallace long term as well. Can benefit them. I want to know if this is something we see on Saturday. You know, are they going to make it a point to get Caden Wallace some work at left guard? Because otherwise, you're talking about again Nick Dawkins contributing in a different way than he has 
or Anthony Donka, who I think they're trying to preserve that red shirt. And maybe he's not quite to the point where he's going to be ready for Big Ten trenches is thrown further into the mix. This is compelling. And we've had a lot of people on our message board for a long time saying, give Caden Wallace a long look at guard. He was a top 100 prospect at that position in 24-7 sports. This is a twofold thing for me. A lot of confidence in what Drew Shelton can accomplish at right tackle, what he's already done on the field at right tackle and, and, and to a wider scale left tackle. It also suggests that we may be without J.B. Nelson in, in front of us for some time. Yeah, just to be clear, I asked James Franklin about J.B. Nelson directly on Tuesday, and he said his status hasn't changed. What does that mean? It means that they're not considering him out for the season, and that's the extent of what they're going to tell us. Tyler, I, I think that if they're going to have any notion – of playing Caden Wallace at guard, you, you're going to have to see some of it this week because I, I don't think you can try to do that, you know, at the horseshoe. I, I don't think you want to make that sort of uh, not colossal change, but it's a significant change, you know, going up against, you know, arguably the best team or one of the two best teams, uh, not arguably clearly one of the two best teams on your schedule and one of the top, you know, top five teams in the nation. So if they're going to do it, I think you absolutely have to see it. I think that's one of the compelling things this week, you know, seeing what Harrison Wallace is able to do and then what they're able to do at that left guard spot. I don't think there's a lack of confidence in Venga, but I, you, you, if something happens there, you want to be able to have somebody who's played some football, you know, going in. I think the other compelling thing that I heard today or this week, and maybe I'm reading too much into it, uh, but James was asked, asked specifically about Hunter Norzad and said that, you know, he's playing well at center, but he also could play guard. So if the, if it comes to that, would they move him over and put Nick Dawkins? I, I don't know. I mean, I know all those parts are, are, are so uh, important, but I don't think we see any of that before we see they, them, them trying Caden Wallace. I think if they're, if we saw it last week and then we saw it again this week and James is talking about it, they, they, they just don't do that for giggles. I mean, they're they're a little bit worried, and I think that's a really key spot uh, for them to get firmed up. And I also think, listen, we've been talking about it since the preseason. We thought this was going to be a battle for right tackle between Drew Shelton and Caden Wallace. And you know what? To Penn State's uh, benefit, Caden Wallace sees the job. And, and if you look at the snap counts, he's had the vast majority of the snaps uh, you know, over uh, Drew Shelton. So, but that's not to say anything negative about Drew Shelton. He played some really good football late last season as a true freshman. So this is where, when we talked about depth early in the season and about how this was the deepest O-line we've seen since, you know, mid, mid nine, mid two thousands, if not mid nineties with, with the, 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 the great 94, 95 line. I think this is where the depth comes into play that you know, not only is there a, a guy behind somebody, but if you need to move people around. And you know what I would also say? What does this say about Caden Wallace? You know, here's a guy in his last year in the program has taken a lot of crap. And you know what? Some of it has been deserved because there have been times that he hasn't played well. And, and he's an adult, and, and I'm sure he, he, he realizes that comes with the territory. But he decides to come back and fights his way to earn a starting job. And now... When you know NFL scouts are looking at all these players, he's willing to, 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 to perhaps move inside if need be. Now, I guess a skeptic could say, well, yeah, that makes him more attractive to the NFL. But I think, you know, given his druthers, he'd rather play one spot the entire year. But I think it speaks to the selflessness of this entire team that we've seen to this point of the season. And I think he's been kind of, to, to me, He's really been a hidden hero for this team and what he stands for, kind of what he represents, being selfless, coming back, fighting, earning what he's needed to earn. So I know I went off on that, but I think highly of that kid. And th the fact that he's willing to do this, I think, speaks very highly of him as well. And he's somebody because of the of the volume of game snaps he has and because it's been a bit of a roller coaster at times, mistakes that he makes in any game are magnified. It's just that's how it is with him right now in the eyes of a lot of fans and, and probably us in the media. 
Uh, but he has certainly been at a different level as a consistent performer this season. You hear from players, you heard from coaches. Caden Wallace, extremely self-aware here in 2023, understanding, you know, not really matching his own personal expectations and understanding that it's not just about doing it one game uh, or even just a couple games. It's about stringing it together for an entire campaign. So, Look, so far, I mean, Zariah Fisher said, said yesterday, it just feels different. He said, matched up against Caden Wallace this year. You can feel the power and the way he's using it. And he said specifically in the run game uh, with Caden Wallace. But we'll find out. One thing that James Franklin said was a bit unusual here was Caden Wallace has a higher comfort level at left guard than he would at right guard. Uh, you know, you're talking about a, a guy going on the other side of the, of the football. We know that Drew Shelton has had a bit of a learning process with, with working on both sides. It sounds like. Caden Walsh is taking to it naturally at the left guard position, which is pretty timely and important potentially for Penn State with what is what is happening at that spot. Explosive plays remain a highly discussed topic uh, uh, for Penn State football here coming out of the bye week. And, and they've got a matchup here against Northwestern where uh, Michael Traney just you know teed us up. He says this defense, uh, as their calling card has been surrounding or surrendering explosive plays. Now, last week, last game, we talked about Northwestern being at the very doormat in rushing yards allowed. And we said, that's the remedy you're looking for, Nick Singleton, Catron Allen, and company. We'll get to the run game in a little bit with J1 Sider. But Daniel, Drew Aller, there's receivers, Harrison Wallace, perhaps. Um, feels like it's put up time against a defense that is ripe for the picking. Again, just not something that you want lingering. Externally, sell you want. I don't think they care much about what we're discussing and tweeting and all that stuff. But I think internally, you don't want this self-doubt, if there is any at all. But you don't want that seed to be planted or developing while you're preparing to go against Ohio State in the horseshoe. Yeah, like I'm looking for the cure for the common cold and they want the cure for, you know, any offensive woes that they have. But, you know, I, I do think there is something to be said for, you know, actually doing it in a game. Um, you know, they can talk all they want about, you know, they're they're repping it, they're running these plays, they're calling it, they just aren't there. Um, but there's a difference between hitting a play like that in Beaver Stadium um, versus doing it you know, on the lash fields where, you know, it's just a, a completely different environment. Um, so I think for Penn State to have the ability to hit on some of those plays, you know, would be really good. Um, but I don't know. I mean, at the same time, though, I mean, they're pretty adamant about not deviating from what they want to do. Um, and I think that there is going to come a time, whether that's Ohio State or Michigan or somebody else, where they're going to be forced to deviate uh, from that. Um, and I think that that's kind of where, where the concern really comes from. Um, you know, at least like for me personally, you know, I'm not worried, really worried that against Northwestern, they're not chucking it deep or they weren't chucking it deep against Iowa. You know, I'm thinking, all right, but what will this look like against, you know, those, those big teams on the schedule or if they get caught in a game where it's coming down to the wire and you just need someone to make a play. Um, so, you know, I think that the, their reasoning, I mean, I think is sound too. You know, you don't want to turn the ball over. You want to keep moving the chains. Um, you know, Nick Singleton, I think that he's, you know, one of Mark's big predictions earlier this year was him coming along as a receiver. Um, and we've really seen that. Uh, I believe that he's surpassed his catches and yards from a year ago already in five games. Jaywan Sider was sure to bring that up. Um, it's been brought up, I think, by Mike Yersich last week that, They've checked the ball down to Nick Singleton a couple times, and it's, you know, the yardage they've been able to gain qualifies as an explosive play uh, through their rubric. Um, so, you know, I think that this is going to be a really good opportunity for Penn State, you know, to put some of these things on film, uh, you know, to really, you know, allow Drew Aller to throw the ball uh, and, and put up some, some big numbers. So, uh, you know, I guess that we want to see Penn State the Penn State offense due to whatever's happening to to the hedges uh, outside of my outside of my window right now. I thought you were entering a motocross race out here. <laughs> uh, if only <laughs> the joys Rev of working from, from our home offices, right? <laughs> yes. Um, Mark, we mentioned before the, the, the offensive line. What what's that going to look like? Will there be some new rotational plans involved there? Certainly the wide receiver group. This is the final 60 minutes before we see this team step on that field against Ohio State. And it gets very real in a hurry in that game number seven. What are you looking for across the field beyond that offensive line unit, beyond that wide receiver group in this tune-up that would maybe either give you 
optimism in picking them to pull off a win next week or perhaps pause in making that prediction? Uh, I, I think, you know, going back to J1 Sider, I think just more consistency from the running game and more decisiveness. You know, Mike Yursich said it last week. James Franklin touched on it, and then J1 touched on it today about these uh, running backs trusting their instincts. And I just don't think we've seen that, especially with Nick Singleton. It almost seems from the outside looking in, you know, I don't see all the practices and everything, but from the games that I've seen, he just doesn't seem as instinctual as he was. And, and I'm wondering if this buy didn't come at a really good time where he could take a step back with the coaches. We know how good Jay Wansider is as a coach, and they could look at tape. That One of the things, and we discussed this, that really jumped out at me after the Northwestern game is when I, I spoke to Drew Aller, you know, I said, how important is this bye week in terms of you getting better? And he reminded me, and I knew this, but you kind of forget it in the grind of the season, that when you're in the grind of a season and you're in a game week, it's very difficult to look back. It's very difficult to self-scout. It's very difficult to break down what you did in the last game. They really spend like half a day on that and then kind of move on from what I understand. The bye week, you're able to really step sit, settle in and, and get dialed into that. So, well, I think that was big for Drew Aller. I also think that's something that was important for Nick Singleton. I, I, it, I'm going to be really anxious to see it. And we may not have a great feel for it until they get to Ohio State, just because, as Mike was saying, you know, this is kind of a, a defense that is probably going to be uh, challenged by the Penn State offense. But we could see little hints of it, you know, if he's just, you know, a little bit quicker or uh, one thing that yours has said, maybe a little more patient, maybe not forcing things. So I just think those are the things that are really important. And, you know, I do think it would be important. I know there was a lot of talk this week about you know just chucking it down the field or just taking shots. I think the thing that ju that jumped out to Franklin is when it was asked, throw it no matter what. I think the issue with that, you know, we've all asked questions and not the not the best way. Nobody's asked more you know goofy questions than I have. But I think when that was phrased that way, that you're looking at a, a sophomore quarterback who has nine touchdowns and zero interceptions, and he's basically all we heard about through preseason camp and through the the, the first five uh, weeks of the season is what a good job he's done at making the right decisions, even if the decision is throwing the ball away and reserving the right to punt. And I think what got to James is when you say throw it no matter what, that's, that's a terrible message to send. If And not that I'm suggesting that Drew Aller would hear that, but I think they've been working against that. So I do think they have to take deep shots, but not no matter what. I think they have to take intelligent deep shots. And I think that's what, what Corey Geiger was kind of getting at. I think it maybe just came out the wrong way. Again, I've asked questions that haven't come out the right way. But I do think it's important to show at least some element of that going into Ohio State. That, okay, it's it's there. You don't have to go out and throw 40 deep balls, but may, maybe one or two that that, that that go the distance. And I think they'll have an opportunity, again, to do that against this defense. You know, when those, you know, when you've got to throw caution to the wind a little bit with the passing attack is when you're down and it's late. And we haven't seen him in that position. And you know, we just had not seen it. There's going to be a moment where, you know, Drew Aller and his offense are going to have to take some gambles because they're playing catch up and it's getting late and the clock's against them. Um, but to this point, they've been on cruise control, and we expect them to stay that way on Saturday. And um, you can't fault the team for being, you know, quote unquote, untested deep into games going on against Ohio State, because then the alternative is you wanted them to struggle at some point in September against one of these teams, and people wouldn't be happy about that either. So, look, well, it's, listen, it's, I can it's I can I give you a quick <laughs> anecdote? Like I, I was yeah. doing another radio show, and, and somebody said, "Hey, Mark, you know, Ohio State's been tested." Uh, do you think Penn State's going to be in a, a bad situation going out there having not been tested? And I said, you know, they had been tested in previous years and led in the fourth quarter, and it didn't really matter, right? So maybe this is a better way to go about doing it. But in all seriousness, I think you could say tested, you could say whatever. I think if you're in Penn State's situation, being able to get through this, tested or not, being able to get to this point of the season and knock on wood kind of where they are with how much they've had to play people, and, you know, injury-wise, again, knock on wood, let's hope everybody across the nation stays healthy this week. 
you know, I think they would take that over being in tight games any day of the week. And I think it's going to serve them better when they ultimately do go out to Ohio State. Good segue into the next point I wanted to bring up here about this game five. Um, look, realistically speaking, we expect it to be another opportunity where Drew Aller and Abdul Carter are watching a lot of football as this one gets later in Beaver Stadium. And, and you're going to see younger components of the roster be able to step up and play. And to this point, just haven't seen this team need to rely in, in really a, any way on their on their freshmen. I think you can give them a lot of credit for the way they've contributed on special teams. But it's not like we're seeing uh, even defensive pieces and these guys who are burning red shirt. We're not seeing them on the field in the first quarter. The Tony Rojas is of the world. Elliot Washington's on Tracy. Much of their work has come special teams or later in contests. So it's been really impressive to see them not because last year you had Nick Singleton, K. Tron Allen, Abdul Carter. You know, the list goes on of guys who had to play early and often for them as freshmen. But this should be a chance to peel back that curtain a little bit get a bit of a longer look at some of those guys who have already burned their red shirt. But Daniel, there's a bunch of dudes who have played in one game or are still trying to make their debut or have maybe gone in for a couple matchups. And, and we'll talk about it in a second because James Franklin has a strategy laid out here. But in your opinion, beyond the obvious names that are front and center for this freshman class, who are you hoping to get a longer look at on Saturday? Yeah, I, it's it's interesting like trying to do this exercise because Jaylon Sider made a really good point earlier today uh, when he was asked about you know seeing Cam Moss and London Montgomery, where you know, he was basically like, you know, it's not just K Nick Singleton, Katron Allen, and uh, Trey Potts. You've got Tyler Holsworth there. You've got Tank Smith there. Um, you know, I think that there's a, a layer of players you kind of have to to work through um, to get down there. But you know, I think that. You know, I think I'll look at the, you know, maybe the linebackers a little bit. You know, I think Tamir Robinson and Kavion Keys are two guys that, you know, we've, you know, at least in the practice windows we've had have, you know, been impressive physically. Um, I mean, the way that Tamir Robinson just kind of looks in that linebacker group with his length um, and how he's transformed his body uh, is something that I think is very intriguing you know, to see on a football field on a Saturday. Uh, KV on keys is kind of on the similar path that Tony Rojas was on. I think uh, in terms of the body development, he's just doing it like a semester behind because he mm -hmm. came here in the summer. Um, you know, Rojas came here at 195, then was in the 220s. Uh, you know, by the time spring ball ended, you know, KV on keys was listed at 195 on signing day as well. Um, on the most recent roster update, I believe he's in the 220s after being in the teens for a little bit. Um, so I think that those are two guys that, um, you know, we saw keys on the travel roster recently. Um, you know, Tamir Robinson is someone who there's a lot of intrigue about what he can do in the future. You know, as someone who I think, you know, was a safety, people see him as an edge rusher, uh, you know, Penn State starting him as a Mike linebacker. Um, you know, there's there's a lot to work with there. So, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of depth on this team. You know, you can't overlook some of the offensive linemen. Um, I think Jim Diono. Every time I see him, it, there's like a, you know, a double take with, mm -hmm. you know, which which scholarship guy am I missing? Like who, which which tackle is that? Um, and it's even even from the press box, you know, before looking through the binoculars, looking down at the offensive line group, you know, he's someone that really stands out to me. So, you know, I think that Penn State has been in a really good spot in terms of being able to save some games for these guys and their red shirts. Um, but yeah, I think that this is a really, really good opportunity for some guys to get some extended run uh, against UMass. Notably, Keys and Ono, I believe, traveled uh, out to Northwestern, so that they were thought highly enough of that and valued enough to, to be on that plane and be on that sideline for the matchup. Uh, Mark, how about you? I mean, there, there, there's a ton of freshmen who are chomping at the bit, I'd imagine, here, and probably understanding that looking at the schedule – these kind of opportunities are, are going to be a little less few and far between. And um, so, so what do you think? I mean, who, if, if we can see someone out there put like a full quarter of, of film together and really get a bit of a sample size, who would you like to see? Uh, Rappelier. I mean, I, 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 there's a guy who, you know, he's also traveled and um, I know they're, they're deep at tight end, but you just look at where he is physically uh, I, I just really like what I've seen of him. And I also think they're going to have an interesting decision to make with Jackson Smolik. Um, you know, he played one snap, I think it was, against Delaware uh, because um, uh, because there was a, a minor injury. 
Uh, but do you want to get another look or do you really feel you need to save all those games in, in case of an injury? So I think they have a real decision uh, to make there. And then another guy who I think is really flying under the radar is uh, Blanding, Ty Blanding. You know, he's a guy who uh, something happened late for that Illinois trip and, and they swapped him in at D tackle for somebody else. But that tells you that they that they think he's playing well. And I think James has mentioned him a couple of times. So not the biggest D tackle, but obviously he's doing some good things with that D squad. And uh, I think he's a guy that it's it would be interesting to see if we could get more than a few snaps. But to me, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of who could make an impact, Rappelier, I mean, I think you could see him come in and catch some balls, but I think the most intriguing story is going to be Smolik and whether they decide, you know, to take one more of those games and, and, and see what see what he has. Interesting point on Smolik. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards James Franklin trying to get as much film of Bo Perbula doing things as possible before they get into the bulk of Big Ten play just to make sure it's all out there. Like if you got Bo Perbula out there for a quarter and a half of possessions where he's throwing the ball a little bit, but certainly probably racking up 70 rushing yards along the way or something like that. I think they'd take that, uh, but we'll see to your point with Smolik. Um, Jamil Lyons is a guy that that's been out of sight for a little bit. It feels like he's starting to resurface. He just wasn't heavily involved with the, some of those varsity defensive linemen in the past few weeks, like we had seen early on. Um, it seems to be changing. I don't know if he's going to get a chance to, to, to get involved because he's already at two games they're kind of towing that line with him, but continue to hear really good things about his potential. But I, I think I'm going with Javen Williams because along with seeing Caden Wallace work at left guard, something new for us in the last couple of weeks has been a little bit of a look at Javen Williams taking some reps at right tackle. Now, in our look, dating back to his early enrollment and through spring practice, he's been exclusively on that left side. And we know they like to cross train some players. Uh, that's been part of the process with Chimzy Ono since he got to campus. It's been a huge part of the process for, for uh, Drew Shelton, but it's just one of those things. If you're trying to decipher some of the things, some of the dominoes that may be falling from a personnel standpoint, if you're saying, okay, well, JB Nelson's maybe out of the equation for a little bit. And now maybe Caden Wallace is more involved at left guard. So that means Drew Shelton's more involved at right tackle, which means you maybe need a new second right tackle or at least a little bit more of a stabilizing presence. So do we see Javon Williams pop up with some reps at right tackle for the first time in his career? The next snap will make it three game appearances for him. And I'll just finish off the topic here. They seem to be stashing some opportunities to play guys later in the season. I don't know if you want to call it maybe a secret weapon status where you get a, 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 a you know a playmaker like Cam Wallace involved in the field in some capacity late in, in November and, and no one's really got any evidence of what this guy can bring to the field or if it's just trying to make sure these guys are fully ready to play before actually putting them out there. But Franklin, in referencing those running backs, London Montgomery and Cam Wallace after practice on Wednesday said, you know, the plan is to try to maybe get them involved later in the season couple games here, maybe three games. And then, you know, you can go into the postseason and be able to utilize a lot of these dudes. And so I think, Daniel, as we finish off with the freshman, that's probably where I put it. We're at midseason just because you haven't maybe seen a guy pop up and play or pop up and play a couple games doesn't mean that it's a loss right now. It sounds like there is an interesting strategy in play for Penn State. I think it's a wise one, especially when things are going well for you from a health standpoint, from a personnel workload standpoint. But there could be some X factors in this freshman class that they may be scheming up right now to use defensively or offensively when people really think they've got a read on the Nittany Lions after seven, eight, nine, ten games. Definitely. I mean, I, I think that before the Delaware game, I picked Cam Wallace as my as my player to watch because <laughs> I was right. I was all in. And then you know, you see Tank Smith out there, you see Tyler Holsworth out there um, at the end. So I think I, I jumped the gun on that one um, a little bit, but. Yeah, I mean, I think that you know, there's a lot of talent on this roster. Uh, you know, saving the eligibility is definitely a bouncing act. But there's something else that stands out to me when thinking about the eligibility, you know, and kind of stashing some of these guys, saving their games is, you know, we saw last year down the stretch, you know, Penn State, you know, just ran through everyone in that last month of the season. Um, and they were doing it in some with guys that were a little banged up. Uh, in some bad weather conditions. And that's where we saw like those walk on true freshman offensive linemen, you know, out there on the field because, you know, they were trying to save Vanga Ioane's red shirt uh, and JB Nelson's red shirt. You, know, you had guys banged up that you couldn't leave out there um, into the latter, stag latter stages of the game. 
um, when things are out of hand. You know, you think about the weather at Indiana, the weather at Maryland. You know, it's not really – you don't want your starters out there late um, in those games that are out of hand. So you know, I think that that's something that is in the back of my mind when, you know, thinking about who we're going to see trying to save games is that you don't really know what this final month of the season uh, is going to look like. I mean, I don't, I don't think that it'll be as quote unquote easy as it was down the stretch last year, um, just because, you know, you've got Michigan in this back half and some of those other teams are a little bit improved and, you know, not every year is the same. Um, but I think that that's something else to factor in too, is that, you know, you need to you need to have some of these guys available in case you need them to eat up some reps at the end of a game, um, you know, against someone who on paper, when you're doing the plan, um, you know, might not necessarily be a, a logical team uh, to, to put in there. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that I'm really curious. I mean, especially when you think about uh, some of these defenders uh, that they have been able to stockpile um, on the back end and, you know, giving them more run, you know, making them bigger parts of the, of the defense, you know, maybe doing something for Cam Wallace or someone on offense. Um, I, I think that they have a lot of options I mean, they can do a lot of things, but I mean, I think that the the eligibility balancing and, and you know towing that line every year, I think, always gets pretty fascinating. They burned ten, 10 red shirts last year. They burned two red shirts in 2020, 2021. Now they're at four, and and thus far, we're just not sure if there's going to be a fifth. I'd imagine we'll get there for one reason or another, but no one obvious to this point, and no one publicly uh, confirmed to this point. J1 Sider, as we mentioned, was available. Something that I just want to mention here not just at Penn State, but he says in his entire coaching career working with running backs, this would be the first time that he is working with redshirt situation as freshmen, preparing guys uh, not to not not to play as freshmen. And and I think that the thing that's going to help Jay Wan here with Cam Wallace and London Montgomery and making sure they're doing everything they can to maximize the situation that you know, it can be tough for a lot of freshman running backs watching so much football is he's very realistic with these guys during the recruiting process. And he'll point and say, you see what's in that room. We've got two NFL running backs. We got Trey Potts, who he just raved about today on Thursday. Everybody's raving about Trey Potts, who they picked up from Minnesota. And that addition of Trey Potts has just been an absolute kind of cushion between those two top running backs and then these two young running backs who are on their own paths. It sounds like London Montgomery has a lot of ground to make up physically right now. Maybe Cam Wallace is further along in some different ways right now. Uh, but it's a really good spot to be in. And, and is, is there anything that we're missing from that J1 Sider conversation, which was tremendous, and we have coverage of it at lines247.com, uh, that, that you think either either of you think we need to pick up on here? I, I thought that the, the question to J1 about his time at Penn State – um, and, you know, looking forward a little bit was was really interesting, um, you know, that he's someone who has been here, you know, a lot longer uh, than I think a lot of people thought uh, he would be, given just how transient uh, those positions can be and how someone of his stature could be in demand. Um, but, you know, I thought it was interesting to hear him say that, you know, he still has his eye out at being a head coach. You know, that's something that um, the way that I interpret it is still an aspiration for him, but you know, he's happy right now. I think his quote was like, he was like, if this was my last job ever, uh, he would be happy. You know, now there's always the caveat that who knows what tomorrow looks like, who knows what opportunities will arise. But I think that that's someone who has just been, you know, so comfortable and been able to develop a lot of cash within, you know, the program, within the coaching staff. And then that translates over to his players, you know, so he has the ability to be super realistic with these guys in the recruiting process. You know, I think when we were talking to Trey Potts earlier this week, Trey Potts was asked what that pit pitch was like when he was in the portal. Um, and he said that it was very black and white, that it's Nick Singleton and Katron Allen, and they need a veteran to come in uh, and, and be behind them and, and contribute when needed. Um, and Trey Potts, you know, I think was very appreciative of that. Um, so, you know, I'm really looking forward to going back and, listening back to everything that Jaylon Sider had to say, because he's always, you know, when we see his name uh, penciled in for Thursday, it's always, uh, you know, I think a little exciting, um, but he, he had a lot of things to say. And, you know, when he talks, I think he's really worth listening to. Yeah. One thing he's I would say, yeah, one thing Sorry, I would say, ahead. Tyler is, um, yeah, the stuff that he was saying about Trey Potts, obviously we realize, you know, what, what an impact that that kid has made uh, coming in, but, Touching on what Daniel said, the fact that he wasn't afraid of competition 
I mean, let's just look at it realistically. And 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 uh, J1 kind of said this to us, you know, at a previous point. But last season, I mean, these two running backs basically chased Kevon Lee and Devin Ford out of the program. And this guy's coming into the program to compete against them. Don't forget Keziah Holmes. They blew yeah, up I, the room, and, and all three of those guys were former top 24-7 prospects. Yeah, thanks thanks for bailing me out. I was looking at our preseason depth chart, and by that time, or by at our uh, opening game depth chart last year, by that time, Keziah was because I had already read the writing on the wall, and they just all bailed. And I, I think that gives some context to, to what Jaywan was talking about in the sense that this guy was not afraid of competition. Other people are running away from it. And I understand it in the era of the transfer portal, but I think that also goes back to the team aspect of, of, of this program so far this season, that you have guys who aren't afraid of competition, who aren't running from it. They're running to it. I mean, that to me, that says something about, about Trey Potts and what he means. And we've had a couple opportunities to talk to him and that kind of comes across in it. Yeah. Well, we got coverage at lines247.com from, from that conversation with Sider. Uh, we had Johnny Dixon, Zariah Fisher, Amin Vanover coming off the practice field on Thursday, uh, on Wednesday as well. So check out all that at lines247.com. You want to talk about confidence and trying to get a, a finger on the pulse for where this defense is? Johnny Dixon is a very confident individual. He talked about a, a little bit about uh, talking the talk and, and walking the walk, which he has done this year. Uh, a very, very healthy confidence right now, exuding from this uh, from this defensive unit. Let's get. Into hey, our I will players. tell people. Hey, yeah. one thing I'll tell pe people to watch the video that we did with Johnny Dixon. <laughs> he is hilarious. I mean, he's so soft spoken with us, but you could see he's a troublemaker. You could see in his eyes. He had like <laughs> this, and I mean that in a positive way. I don't mean yeah. that in a negative way. But when we were talking to him about being a trash talker, you could see his eyes lighting up and how much he just enjoys that and how much he enjoys playing football. So sometimes it, it's fine to, to read about something, but sometimes we put these videos up. And if you go to our front page and just look at the Johnny Dixon, Dixon trash talking one, you, you could see where that guy's a troublemaker, but, but in a good way that not, I'm not saying that in a bad way in a fun sort of uh, you could see where that rubs off on other people and, and the kind of qualities that you need playing cornerback at this level. Yeah, he will stir it up for you at the cornerback position. And if you want one spot where you can be a little borderline cocky on the football field, it is that cornerback spot because that's the nature of the beast there. All right, let's get to other players now. And we got a few to watch in this matchup, and we expect to see plenty of Penn State players involved for these four quarters. I think we can probably stay away from the freshman class considering uh, the conversation that we just had. Daniel, you can lead us off here. Yeah, I'm going to go with Bo Prabula. I think that we're going to see a lot of him. Um, and I think that, you know, maybe we'll see him throw uh, a little bit more. Um, you know, we saw him, you know, air it out to Trey Potts and that sort of little, not necessarily like a, a trick play, but a little misdirection um, with the the fake quarterback power and then, you know, popping up to to pass it to Trey Potts. So, you know, I think that Perbula is someone that, you know, a lot of people, I think, want to see what he can do, um, you know, in the in the normal flow of the offense. Uh, you know, we've heard a lot that there's a, you know, they have a special package for him um, that, you know, maybe next week at Ohio State is when we see it, you know, in the sort of run of play. Um, and we kind of, but we, and we kind of have an idea of what that'll be. You know, that'll be some quarterback runs, maybe a couple passes here or there. But, you know, we want to see, you know, how Bo Prevula has developed as a passer, what he can bring, you know, in case his number gets called you know, can the Penn State offense kind of really still stay on schedule in its kind of normal way um, with him at the quarterback? And I think given how we all expect this game to go, you know, we should see him pretty early and he should get a significant number of snaps. Mark, where are you going there? I am not staying away from the freshman. I'm going okay. with Tony. Ro I'm going with Tony Rojas, even though He's really not a freshman anymore. He's played a lot of football, but I think he's going to get an opportunity uh, to do a lot of things. You mentioned uh, earlier, how much are they going to need Abdul Carter in this game? How much risk do you want to put him at? I think we're just, we, we've just kind of seen the, the, the very uh, edge of what Tony Rojas is able to do. He's a tremendous athlete, was gifted on both sides of the ball in high school. And it's not going to be my bold prediction, but I wouldn't be surprised if he makes some sort of big turnover and, pick six or scoops up a fumble or something. But I think he's a guy who could get a lot of snaps 
who I think is a big part of the future of that linebacking core, who for that reason bears watching, not simply because he's a freshman, but I think he's obviously played a lot of football. And I think this will be a nice opportunity to see him not just on special teams, not just in a limited backup role, but playing a bunch of snaps. Rojas reached a double digit snap total in four of the first five matchups for Penn State. That Those totals will definitely rise. If we're saying freshman, uh, King Mack to me, I want to keep an eye on him. He has, he has been absent from the defensive plan for the last couple of weeks. I shouldn't say the plan, but what we've seen on field, they've stuck to the that foursome at the safety spot against Iowa and against Northwestern. King Mack's been a mainstay on special teams, but I think we've all seen it when he gets a run at, uh, at safety good things happen and he seems to find the ball. So uh, does that surface again late? Uh, but my player of the watch that I wrote down here, Caden Wallace, uh, and I won't spend time here because we just did a lot of that, but I think Mark laid it out perfectly. If you see him play some left guard in this game, I think you can just bank on seeing it in Columbus, that, that that's going to be part of the plan. Um, unless it turns into a disaster here against, against UMass, which I don't think would be the, the case. Um, if you do not see Caden Wallace play left guard, then it's hard for me to imagine that being unveiled in Columbus. So, Mark, you kind of hit it on the head where I was going to go with this answer. Um, I just think we're going to learn a lot about where things stand at left guard. Uh, is Vango Ioane going to handle every snap between uh, the point that this team hits the field to, to the point that they decide to, to, to call off the dogs and put in the backups? Or are we going to see a concerted effort by Phil Troutwine and the staff to get other guys looks there and maybe get other guys involved at right tackle along the way, as I referenced earlier. So one of those fascinating things in a game where you know you think you know how it's going to end up from the win-loss column, and that seems like a slam dunk, the personnel stuff is always the, the, the most uh, pivotal thing to glean. And I think the offensive line and what they do there is going to be a, a kind of a lesson moving forward in what they might want to do against Ohio State. Um, bold predictions, regular predictions. We'll, we'll go with scores first, and then you can serve up your bold prediction. And Mark, we begin with you for this round. Yeah, my score prediction is 62 to 6. I made it a significant time ago, so I wasn't aware what the weather conditions will be. But you know me, I've made my prediction. I'm going to stick to it. I think this is a team that really, you know, has struggled against some not great offensive teams in Auburn and Arkansas State gave up 50 plus to both of them so I think even on a bad day Penn State has an opportunity uh, to put some points on the on the board in terms of you know I'm kind of going in a similar direction to you Tyler with my bold prediction uh, with your player to watch I don't think for a lot of the regulars this is a really big game but I do think it's an important game for Trey Wallace for the reasons we spoke of before doesn't have a catch uh, since the first couple games of the season um, you know, has been struggling. It was struggling with some sort of injury, but appears to be, you know, back at full go. I think it's important for him to kind of get his mojo back before they head to Columbus. Everybody else, you know, again, maybe a little bit with the running back, running backs, it'd be good to see them spring some things. But I think for him in particular, it's important to have a big game. And I think he will. I think he's going to score two touchdowns receiving, which would double his career total to this point. Uh, but I just think it's imperative for them to get him involved. And I think he'll be up for the challenge. I think he's going to be ready to go. Daniel, your predictions? Similar to Mark, I, I made this prediction before, you know, factoring in the, the weather conditions, weather forecast. But I also did that before the Iowa game, and that really ended up not mattering. Uh, so, you know, uh, I have Penn State winning 56 to 10. Um, you know, I think that they're really going to control the game, um, really be able to do whatever they want. I mean, I think with the talent that UMass has in terms of these former, you know, FBS guys or former Power Five guys that have transferred down, you know, wouldn't be a surprise if there was, you know, something similar to what we saw at Delaware where someone gets loose for for a big play off of a, a missed assignment here or there. But, you know, I really don't think there's going to be a, a consistent threat. Um, for, for bold prediction, I'm going back to the Nick Singleton well. Uh, you know, I think, <laughs> I think he still do. Uh, and I think that maybe that happens this weekend. You know, I have him down for 150 yards um, and a, a touchdown run of at least 40 yards. I mean, UMass defense averaging nearly six yards a carry. 220 yards a game. Um, I think that, you know, we know the type of athlete that Singleton is um, and what he's capable of doing. So I think that we'll see him get loose um, a little bit in the second level. And I think the Penn State offensive line should be able to push UMass around. 
Yeah, 150 yards, 40 yard plus touchdown run. That would do the trick in, in terms of dispelling some of the concerns regarding number 10 and, and that run game. Um, when, when I'm going to go again with them covering the spread. I'm going a lot to a little, regardless of, of whether it's raining or sunny. And if people are just checking in and I haven't been following the weather forecast right now, it's in the low 60s. It's, it's been you know pretty nice weather here in, in Happy Valley, but we're looking at mid 40s and rain on, on Saturday come kickoff, which is a big part of the reason why uh, I don't know if my daughter is going to make her debut at Beaver Stadium. It's her second birthday Saturday. She was planning to be at the UMass game. Uh, it's kind of uh, we may hold off on that situation, but we know that these teams are going to show up and we know that Penn State is probably going to pummel Northwestern. I'm sorry, UMass over the course of this matchup. Um, and it, it feels like it's been a revolving door of teams that Penn State is going to pummel. And I think it'll be a lot of that same blueprint where they're able to get Drew Aller out of it. I, I think Drew Aller gets four total touchdowns and in, in fewer than three full quarters. And yet again, we have to wait to see him perform in the fourth quarter when the pressure's on for another game. Um, and I think Bo Perbula, you know, will, will handle his opportunity well enough that the points keep piling up. So I'm going to go 55 to 10 uh, Penn State covering that six touchdown spread. And they'll go to Columbus 6-0 and in the season, 6-0 and versus the spread. And there have been some big numbers thrown up this season. And that's really all you can ask for. Um, and we'll find out that those style points stack up on Saturday, too. And my bold prediction would help with that. Uh, an explosive play touchdown of 25 plus yards on the first possession for Penn State. So hearkening back to that touchdown throw to, to Keandre Lambert Smith on the first possession of the season opener. Uh, and then they get two of those kind of scores before halftime both through the air. Maybe James Franklin gives a thumbs up to the press box after one of those touchdown passes. But I think we see some sparks start to fly uh, from that pass attack, and we see it relatively early in this matchup. Guys, appreciate it, uh, as always, for, for jumping on for these Jumbo Thursday episodes. As we look ahead, we'll be, all be back in Beaver Stadium uh, several hours before the matchup uh, between these two squads. Um, anything else to add before we say goodbye for now? I'm just glad you went with the thumbs up as opposed to another finger gesture. <laughs> I think that'll serve us well as, as a goodbye here on this episode and of this week of the Lions 24-7 podcast. We're back with you on Saturday evening following the matchup when we're fresh out of Beaver Stadium. Daniel Gallon, I know that his voice will be back at, at 100% by then. We'll be with you to guide you through whatever went down in Beaver Stadium. Uh, between now and then, check out our content at lions247.com. There's a new batch of top 24-7 rankings for the 2024 recruiting class, and there are some significant risers in this Nittany Lions class. Tyler Calvaruso has you covered with that, along with some of the visitors making their way to campus from a recruiting angle for this Saturday's matchup. Uh, on behalf of everybody here at Lions 24-7, I'm Tyler Donahue. This has been the Lions 24-7 Podcast.